Good evening. Welcome to this place, this warm place on a cold, snowy evening. Good to see all of you here. I'm Jay Rundell. I think I know many of you. I'm the president here. Uh, but for those of you who might be here for the first time, welcome. We'll keep the introduction somewhat short tonight because many of you were here earlier as we got our start uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, John Campen will, uh, Dr. John Campen will be uh, giving a more formal introduction of our speaker for the evening. I would simply like to welcome you and express thanks on behalf of our community to the Williams family and those who have supported this lectureship for many years. Uh, Ron Williams was a member of the faculty uh, from 1971 till 1981, uh, died uh, a sudden uh, death and uh, was a uh, which became a loss to this community, uh, which also elicited a response from the community that brought this lectureship uh, in, into being. In the last few years, we've had some additional support from the Williams family, and I am grateful for that. Uh, Lee Williams was a small child uh, when he uh, grew up on this campus and has very clear memories of visiting scholars from afar who would come and engage his father and others in important ways. Uh, Lee is now a senior official in the Treasury Department and is uh, very interested in what we do here and particularly in this kind of event. So he has been very generous with us in recent years and uh, I just want to express my gratitude to him and to that family and to this community for making this lectureship what it is. Dr. Campen, would you come forward? Good evening. It's good to see you. Um, I want to again repeat how honored we are to have Dr. Daniel Boyarin with us today. Uh, I won't repeat all of what I said this morning, uh, but will repeat some of it um, in an order that you uh, have some appreciation for who has uh, offered to spend the day with us. Dr. Daniel Boyarin is the Herman P. and Sophia Tubman Professor of Talmudic Culture at the University of California, Berkeley. He's always in the middle of debates about identity and about who we are, particularly as religious people with a variety of identities. And as I said, he has the audacity to muddy the waters by questioning the broadly accepted categories that we can identify in a rather linear fashion, the manner in which Christianity grew out of Judaism and each became an independent religion. After my introduction this morning, we spoke further at lunch, and neither one of us knows how long we've known each other. So I won't repeat the story I told. It's only one story in a series of lifelong incidents. Um, I do want to again mention that through these encounters, I have been in the presence of a man of towering intellect with command of a massive number and variety of texts methodologically informed and very astute. He teaches and publishes in areas such as identity and race, gender studies, sexual identity with regard to Jewish texts, as well as the subjects that bring us here uh, today. But fundamentally, He's devoted to the study of the text. In all of your conversations with him, what you will notice is that he believed texts matter. And with his attention to methodology, he'll also equally emphasize it matters how you read texts the questions you ask, the presuppositions you bring with you. But in contrast to some other trends which emphasize methodological sensitivities, he won't let you ignore the text. 
got to be read. My esteem for his work has only risen throughout the years. As I mentioned, Dr. Boyarin has a master's and doctorate from Jewish Theological Seminary as well as a master's in Semitic languages from Columbia. And I emphasize the importance of that legacy for Jewish studies today in North America. The shape of Jewish studies in North America today was set by the people that spent time in the classes at JTS and Columbia University in the late 70s and 80s. Uh, that's where what we know as Jewish studies really took form. And Dr. Boy Aaron was part of that pivotal group of students. Today, or uh, let me mention, first of all, that one of the ways he distinguished himself early on was through his uh, work on theories of redaction of the Babylonian Talmud. And today you'll hear references in academic meetings to the Berkeley School, the Berkeley approach to it Near Eastern literature. That's the result of Dr. Boyarin's work. With Saul Lederberman, his teacher, he turned his attention also to Greek literature. And that's when he began to engage in depth with Christian texts that lead him to uh, do the kind of work that brings him to campus today. Because out of his work, suggesting that the formation of the Talmud and the culture and institutions that we know as Talmudic Judaism, that since they arose later than we used to believe, that they, in a sense, are a response to the growing Christianization of the Western world, rather than vice versa. So, when we talk about the Jewish backgrounds of the New Testament, we could also talk about the New Testament backgrounds of Judaism in an equal discussion. And so that's, that's the significance. That's the background that he brings to our work here and to the uh, uh, witnessed in the many books that, uh, that he has authored including the ones listed on your, uh, on your program, as well as uh, the book that I particularly like, the title. And the book is very good also. I heard many of the lectures in the formation of that book, Socrates and the Fat Rabbis. Uh, many of the subjects that he's talking about today are covered uh, in a preliminary way in his The Jewish Gospels, the story of the Jewish Christ, and many of the subjects that we've talked about today are covered in that particular book. One other paid, paid kind of, uh, not announcement, but um, explanation, that here at Mathesco we have developed a biblical studies program precisely out of the influence of people like Dr. Boyarn. The reason that we have a requirement in the middle of our biblical studies program in which it's necessary to study either the Jewish literature or other literature of the Greco-Roman world prior to returning to the canonical text in the senior year is precisely because of the work of people such as Dr. Boyard. So we are deeply in your debt for your impact on what we do. <laughs>
welcome? <laughs> I guess so. Um, about 15 years ago, I taught for a semester at Harvard Divinity School. And uh, I was visiting professor of New Testament there for a semester. And I taught, the, gave a graduate seminar on the fourth gospel. So one of the students came up to me and said, how come in the Department of New Testament here at Harvard, no one is teaching canonical New Testament texts? And I said, because canonical texts can be so boring. So she said to me, so how come you're teaching a canonical New Testament text? And I said, I'm not. I'm teaching a non-canonical Jewish text. <laughs> and that makes all the difference. <laughs> Canons, in general, are a way of containing the most explosive texts and making sure that they don't do anything explosive. Right? We put them together in, in canons and we teach them canonically and contain their power. So, um, exploding canons <laughs> is the way, one way to let the logos free in the world. Right? Uh, somebody asked me this morning, one of the people who were at the Hebrews lecture this morning, I don't think he's here tonight, you know, went on and cited the next couple of verses about the power of God's word to explode things, right? To, to blow things open. Um, so getting things out of their canons is a way of um, releasing their canonicity from another point of view. So I would propose that Mark is best read as a text of Second Temple Judaism, simpliciter. While Paul, also a Jew, of course, marks a much more radical swerve from what can be known and said about the Judaism of his time. Part of the background of this paper and this uh, research is the um, an, a pushback against the growing movement to read Mark as simply a disciple of Paul. And I think the story is much, much more com complicated than that. The old saw about Jesus not being a Christian because Paul hadn't invented Christianity yet has something to it. I would nonetheless modify this in two ways. First of all, I think Paul did not yet know that he was inventing Christianity either. And secondly, the decisive move that would lead to the invention of Christianity had not been taken in any of the Gospels, including Mark. Especially for the first gospel, by which I mean Mark. I know that Matthew is usually described as the first gospel, but I think that historically speaking, um, m most of the world would agree that Mark is the first gospel. And when I say the world, I, I mean the people who read and think seriously about texts. The um, medieval Tosafot, the medieval commentary on, on uh, medieval commentators on the Talmud, will say, with respect to a certain line in the Talmud, the whole world, the whole world objects here. The whole world has a question about this passage, right? The whole world, consisting probably of 500 people, in. So that's my world too. Especially for the first gospel, Mark, I would claim that Jesus is portrayed as defending the Torah, that is Moses, and not attacking it in any way, shape, or form. 
This has enormous historical consequences precisely since now it seems almost clear that Mark is the first gospel. So what is, it the, what is at the foundation moment, the founding moment of the gospel tradition? Is it an attack on Moses or a defense of Moses? And I want to say it's a defense of Moses. Many influential scholars and Boltman and his students prominently among them have insisted on a Jesus who is as un-Jewish as possible, Explicit, explicitly articula, articulating excuse me, a principle of dissimilarity, that's what they call it, where only that which is supposedly antithetical to the quote-unquote Judaism of the time is taken as authentic words of Jesus. This interpretation of the evidence would have the effect of rendering any appearance of similarity with Judaism, as New Testament scholarship has imagined that quote-unquote religion, the product of an early church that was a Judaizing church, especially in Matthew. While the original message of Jesus is the idea that over time became orthodox within the historical Christian churches, to wit that the law was abrogated by Jesus entirely and quite without concern for continuity with traditional Israelite Torah. Was the earliest Jesus movement a movement that began in utter rejection of Moses and his Torah, as nearly all commentators on Mark would have it? Or was it something quite different? To cite a recent author who has formulated this well we note that the question of whether Jesus taught or fought the law is essential. Right? Referring, of course, to that great, that great song, I fought the law and the law won, right? <laughs> did Jesus, was, did, whether Jesus taught or fought the law. Paul, I still think, although I'm wavering on this too, fought the law. But I don't think Jesus did, and I don't think Mark's Jesus did. The example of Mark 7, 15 to 19 is a telling one, and especially the unfortunate fate of 7, 16. Uh, this is the wrong, wrong hand up. You all, do you have Mark 7 in front of you? Can anybody, can anybody find Mark 7, 16 on this handout? Right. That's it. It's gone. No, no. I just wanted to know whether, whether you, anybody could find Mark 7, 16 on the handout. The example of Mark 7, 15 to 19 is a telling one, and especially the unfortunate fate of 7, 16, which read once before it was excised, if any man has, have ears to hear, let him hear, as we shall presently see, as it were. I suggest that the elision of this verse is part of a project to convert the Gospel of Mark from a Messianic Jewish to a Gentile Christian text. In this paper, I shall present my reading of this passage and then contrast it with what, with what seems at first glance to be a Pauline parallel. And then finally, by considering the place of Moses in 2 Corinthians 3, draw a decisive contrast between Mark and Paul with respect to their respective Moses. Moses. Mark 7.16 is a phantom verse, lately honored more often by its absence than its presence. Its absence in two important early witnesses to the gospel has led to its near complete occlusion in modern texts and translations. You know how I discovered Mark 7.16? For years I'd been reading Mark 7 and talking about it and interpreting it and not even noticing that, that it went from 15 to 17. And then I went to one place to give a lecture, and I asked that they prepare a handout similar to, to um, 
today of Mark 7. And I did look at that handout, and in that, that place, it was in Britain, um, they prepared a handout from the AV, the King James Bible. And all of a sudden, there was a verse that I had never seen before. Thus, for instance, the NRSV. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. And then it says 16, and nothing. And then 17, when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. In the AV, verse 16 was included. But nearly all translations since into English and all modern scholarly editions excise this verse. I will argue in this brief intervention that this stone spurned by the builders is indeed the cornerstone for understanding this passage, which is otherwise nearly incoherent. And I will suggest as well that this reinterpretation is of major significance for understanding the Gospel of Mark and thus of the early history of the Jesus movement. The whole context of Mark 7 suggests that here Jesus speaks from the position of a traditional Galilean Jew whose community and traditional practices are being criticized and interfered with from outside, that is from Jerusalem, by the Judeans, as is emphasized in the incipit of the story itself. Jesus accuses these Pharisees of introducing practices that are beyond what is written in the Torah or even against what is written in the Torah, and fights against their so-called tradition of the el elders, kataten paradosin ton presbuteron, which they take to be as important as the Torah, or sometimes in the eyes of their opponents, such as Jesus, as uprooting or superseding the Torah. I would assert, moreover, that Jesus' Galilean disciples were following their own accepted traditional practice in their refusal of the non-biblical notion that impure foods could render the body impure, and hence their refusal to wash their hands, to ritual, ritually wash their hands before eating. Jesus' disciples are upbraided by these upstarts from Jerusalem for not observing the purity structures that they had introduced and demanded on the basis of the traditions of the elders. Jesus responds vigorously, accusing them of hypocrisy and of ascribing a self-importance to their own rulings and practices that is greater than that of the Torah. There is thus nothing in this passage, even in the Markan version, a fortiori in the Matthean version, that suggests that Jesus is calling for abandoning the Torah at all. The Galileans were antipathetic to the urban Judean Jerusalemite Pharisaic innovations. The great advantage of this interpretation, I think, from a purely exegetical point of view, is that the narrative remains coherent from its beginning to its end. Now, surely an interpretation that, that reads a a narrative text as making sense ought to be preferred to a reading that makes it incoherent. It begins with a controversy over a Pharisaic innovation, namely the washing of hands. It continues with Jesus' attack on the tradition of the elders, that set of practices and ideas that the Pharisees held and which were not in the written Torah, and the Pharisees admit that, claiming that this is an alternative source of tradition, and which were the source of sharp controversy among Jews right through the Middle Ages, and ends with a rejection of an entire complex of Pharisaic stringency with regard to eating practices and purity that was the source of the requirement for that ritual hand, hand washing before eating. The development of Jesus' argument from hand-washing to other purity practices to the allegedly Pharisaic innovation of vows that make one forbidden to care for one, one's parents to a homily on the relative significance of pious practice and piety is perfectly coherent on this account. 
and we need ascribe no editorial intervention, quilting, or felting of sources to make perfectly good sense of the argument of the chapter. As you see, I'm a biblical literalist and fundamentalist. No quilting or felting, quilting or felting. As I like to tell my students, especially when I'm teaching in Christian seminaries, I think that Jesus said everything that is ascribed to him. Practices to say, well, this half of the verse Jesus said, and the second half of the verse came from the early church, and the next verse was, uh, you know, was Jesus' disciples, and um, then the verse after that was a kind of Judaizing, backsliding. That's not reading. That's not reading a text. I'm not speaking on a theological level now. I'm speaking simply on the question of the text and whether the first approach to the text, the first and most important approach to the text is one that seeks coherence within the text rather than breaking it up into little bits and pieces. This is the strong support for this reading, especially given that the received interpretation actually has Jesus arguing hypocritically or at least not in good faith. First, complaining that the Pharisees depart from Moses, and then he, supposedly, discarding Moses. While there are indeed some recent scholars who have seen that 15a is about purity and impurity, and not kashrut, and this is the key distinction that is missed by so many, by so many interpreters of this, uh, of this passage and so much else. There are two systems within Jewish law, within the halakha. Purity and impurity, and kosher and not kosher. Kosher food can be impure, can become impure. That doesn't make it not kosher. It doesn't mean that you're not supposed to eat it. And it doesn't mean that eating it will make your body impure. It means if you're a priest, you're not supposed to eat it. Virtually all of the more modern commentators I've consulted take 15b to refer in its plain sense to something called moral impurity and not Levitical or ritual impurity. Thus, for instance, Collins, this is Adele Collins, who writes the not but formula in verse 15 indicates that moral purity is given a higher priority than ritual purity. Similarly, Robert Gundry, at the other end of the, of the country and uh, the um, you know, continuum from so I'm just trying to say, say that this is, you know, um, a um, has nothing to do with whether people are on the progressive or conservative end of the spectrum. Equal opportunity uh, misreading here. We should therefore take 15b as a statement about moral defilement. Needless to say, all modern commentators take verse 16 as not read as well. If, however, in verse 15, Jesus is already saying that ritual impurity does not contaminate, but only moral impurity from within contaminates, then it becomes virtually impossible to understand why the disciples refer to it as a parable. What kind of a parable? It's a straightforward homily, if that's what Jesus is saying. That nothing that comes into the body makes one impure, but only bad things that one says. Where's the parable? There is nothing whatever parabolic about it. It's also difficult to see what precisely they would not understand in such an ostensibly plain-spoken homily. So my hero, Matthew Henry, quote, they asked him when they had him by himself concerning the parable, for to them it seems it was a parable. Right? Matthew Henry knows that it's not a parable. 
Why would the disciples think it was a parable? Now, I know that there's a commentatorial tradition that takes the disciples in Mark to be foolish, right? That that's a pretty strong tradition. But one must assume a devastating inability to understand on the part of the disciples, much more than their usual thickness, if they heard Jesus' allegedly clear statement and didn't get the point. What on earth would have made them think there is a parable here at all? And if we ascribe so much stupidity to the disciples, then it's hard to understand why they are disciples at all. Right? It's one thing to say that it takes them a while to get Jesus' message and that that's part of the drama of the gospel, right? That the, that the disciples had to learn to understand how, uh, how radical this messianic intervention was. But if they're incapable of hearing at all a simple homily, then who are they? I submit that it is only if we read verse 16 that we can understand what has happened in this anecdote. Jesus made a statement of literal halachic, not moral, not anagogical, not tropological nature in its plain sense. Because, guess what friends? There is nothing mentioned in the Torah that taken into the body makes the body impure. What makes the body impure? Things that come out of the body. Blood, semen, gonorrhea fluxes. That's what makes a body impure. But Jesus then signified that this halachic statement that his disciples would perfectly well understand because it was absolutely good, good and well-known scriptural rule from Leviticus, he signified that it was a parable by using the formula, let him who has ears hear. Once Jesus said, let him who has ears hear, then everybody would know that's a parable because that's what Jesus says after saying parables. But all he had said up to that point was straightforward Leviticus law. It is precisely the declaration of verse 16 that so mystifies the disciples. They have heard a simple and, as we shall see in a moment, quite accurate statement of the Torah against the Pharisees' alleged distortions of same. But then they have been informed that if, i.e., the law itself is a parable. And it is that that they don't get. Without verse 16, they would have been not at all puzzled or troubled at Jesus' intervention. They would have had no reason to be. Arguing against the Pharisees, Jesus says, there's nothing that goes into the mouth that makes a body impure. It's true. So why are you, why are you uh, as we would say in Yiddish, hocking us at China, right? Why are you making trouble for us and telling us we've got to wash our hands before we eat? I mean, we've got to have clean hands, too, but that's just hygiene. But why do we have to do this, you know? Fancy stuff. But then Jesus would not have conveyed his message. But his message is that the punctilious and correct observance of what the Torah actually says is what is necessary for us to understand its deeper significance. Let those who have ears hear. Now, I've recently interpreted the actual halachic issue here at some length. In, 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 in the chapter of uh, the Jewish Gospels to which um, uh, Dr. Kampen referred. Referring as well to an article published by Yair Furstenberg on the subject, so I will only quickly summarize the point here. According to the written Torah, it is indeed the case that foods that are impure, that is, which have been in contact with dead bodies or touched by people with various fluxes from the body or on which insects have fallen, do not render the body impure. Impurity is conveyed upon a human body only through things that come out, genital blood, semen, and gonorrheal fluxes. It is therefore only the Pharisaic tradition that showed concern for the purity of food, 
by requiring ablutions before eating, suggesting that the food could, be, could become impure and render, render the body impure as well. Jesus thus, appropriately for the context of the pericope as a whole, in verse 15, is still continuing his theme of Pharisaic distortions that interfere with or contradict the plain meaning of the Torah. And it fits perfectly with what he says afterwards, that the Torah says you've got to feed your mother and father, and anyone who doesn't feed their mother and father is cursing. But you, Pharisees, you say that someone can take a vow and then not have to feed or even be forbidden to feed the father and the mother. So what is this about your tradition, your so-called tradition of the elders, that gives you the right to contradict Moses, to supersede Moses? But he informs them and us also that the plain meaning of the purity practice enjoyed by, enjoined by scripture has a deeper symbolic interpretation, a tropological reading, by telling us, let those who have ears hear. If you distort and change the practice of the law, you will not understand its inner meaning either. A parable by definition has a literal and a figurative side. If Jesus talks about a vineyard, but he means the kingdom of heaven, that is a parable. Consequently, if we have here a parable, it must too have a literal and a figurative side. If when Jesus said it, said it is not what goes in that makes one impure, but only that which goes out, if already when he said that he was not declaring a literal fact, a fact of the Torah, but instead just making the moral point directly, then there would be no parable at all here, just a sermon. That this point has been thoroughly missed by scholarly commentators is shown by the multiple approving citation of Vesterholm's comment that 715 means that a person is not so much defiled, not so much defiled, but by that which enters him from outside as he is by that which comes from within. Right? Not so much. Others argue against Vesterholm's suggestion and say that Jesus meant to reject purity practices entirely. But all such discussion is actually odios once we understand that Jesus is simply offering the true literal law of Moses, which has an absolute binary opposition between that which goes in and doesn't defile and that which comes out of the body, the lower parts of the body, and does defile. Only that which comes, in, comes out defiles the body, not that which goes in. Henry, writing in the 17th century, got the point. Quote, As by the ceremonial law, whatsoever, almost, he says, comes out of a man defiles him. Le Leviticus 15.2, Deuteronomy 23.13. So that which comes out from the mind of a man is that which defiles him before God and calls for a religious washing, right? The literal signifies the tropological, the moral. But without the literal, without the li literal understanding of the law, you miss the moral significance. That's, that's Jesus' argument. Not that uh, the, the moral significance um, erases the literal law. Jesus is making an argument here in my reading, very similar to Philo's. Philo says there are some people who say, since the law has an allegorical sense, we can skip the, 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 the literal and, and practice and go straight to the allegorical sense. And Philo says, if you don't practice the literal, you ultimately lose the allegorical also. Jesus asserts the law and then offers it up for a parabolic interpretation as signified by let him who has ears hear. The disciples recognized through this phrase that a parable had been delivered. That is, they understood that the statement was literal and that there was a figurative second meaning, but they could not discern that meaning on their own. They did not understand the parable. I submit that this is the only reading in both senses that renders this sequence of verses intelligible. The disciples were puzzled because they heard their rabbi making a straightforward point about the law, the literal side of the parable, but didn't understand why he signifies that this was a parable. They caught the literal sense but needed help with the figure. 
And then Jesus answers them. Why does the Torah only render impure that which comes out, not that which goes in, if not to teach us something, namely that matters of the heart that are externalized in evil behavior also convey moral impurity? As Menachem Kister has pointed out, Jesus' statement is only coherent if he is speaking about kosher food that has become defiled in the manners that I suggested before which is, of course, entirely consistent with the context of the narrative in which the disciples are not being accused of eating food that is not kosher, but, fo but food that has become impure through the touching of it by impure hands. And it is that impurity that Jesus declares invalid, not the distinction between kosher and non-kosher. In direct contradiction to the Pharisaic innovation of washing hands to prevent food from becoming impure, Jesus says, you may eat kosher food, whether or not it has become defiled and impure, and you will not become thus impure, just as the written Torah literally teaches. But this has absolutely nothing to do with abrogating the law at all. It is the finale of Jesus' answer as to why his disciples, and presumably he too, do not perform ritual ablution of the hands prior to eating. Follow Moses and not the human traditions of the Pharisees, says Jesus. Literally. Right? He says they are substituting human traditions for the law. This reading, I submit, renders the pericope consistent and coherent from the beginning to its end. Pharisees have come from Judea, Jerusalem, seeking to impose their tradition of the elders, Masorah Vot in Hebrew, on the Jews of the Galilee. This is the explicit content of Jesus' charge against them from the beginning of the pericope until its end. You, you Pharisees, arrogantly, hypocritically, substitute your human tradition for divine doctrine, as you yourself concede by referring to it as traditions of the elders. Jesus not only angrily rejects their arrogant attempt to replace the written Torah with traditions of human origin, but also explains why this is so dangerous, dangerous a practice for the anagogical meaning goes entirely awry. Right? The whole point of the law is to teach us the impurity that is conveyed by evil thoughts and evil speech. But it can only teach us that if we understand and practice the literal meaning that that which comes out of the body makes the body impure and not that which goes in. The Pharisaic attempt to add to the Torah in order to protect its rules end up, ends up subverting God's intent as expressed in the Torah. No abrogation of the law is thus comprehended here. I take this conclusion to be virtually incontrovertible as a straightforward reading of the text as we have it. What, however, a voice will ask at this point, you'd all be shouting it if you weren't polite, is to be done with verse 19c, and thus he purified all food. Katarizon pantata bromata. I would assert as a matter of principle that it would be a bad reading practice to allow one admittedly difficult and syntactically awkward phrase in the entire passage, not to say the entire corpus, control our reading of that passage and render that which is coherent, incoherent. Following this principle, I will offer three different explanations for the, for the verse set, for that fragment of the verse. The most obvious way to deal with this problem, and perhaps in the end the most valid, would be simply to remark that verse 19c is a gloss in the text. Verse 19c is a strange plant here one that interrupts and disrupts the logic of the dispute and, the, and its development, renders Jesus a hypocrite, accusing the Pharisees of departing from Moses when he himself is about to completely abrogate Moses himself, and moreover concludes with a total non sequitur. It would hardly be a stretch to consider it a gloss that was added by a Gentile Christian voice committed to the notion of a dominical permission to eat all foods. I need not argue whether Mark was the one who added this strange gloss or not, but if some Mark or other, then surely not the Mark 
who authored the entire perfectly coherent, consistent, and logical discourse of Jesus in the whole pericope. In other words, if one claims that this is a Markan gloss, then would have to concede that the bulk of Mark was not written by Mark. And Mark contradicts the bulk of Mark. Whoever this glossator was, it would seem that he might have been the author of two other glosses in the pericope as well, namely the verse explaining that the Pharisees and all of the Eudaioi do not eat bread unless they wash their hands with a fist, and the gloss explaining the term korban in verse 11, right? all of which would be perfectly understandable to the original uh, um, hearer, hearers of Jesus' words. All of which suggests an author writing for the purposes of a Gentile church, but not the author of the Gospel of Mark. A second possibility would be to insist that katharizon means to declare pure, not to permit the forbidden. Remember, there are permitted things that can be impure and forbidden, thing, forbidden things that have nothing to do with purity and impurity. Just as in Hebrew, there is a distinction between litaher and lihatir. Litaher to render pure, lihatir to permit. This reasoning would propose that the Greek here is the equivalent of the first Hebrew term and not the second. And thus he purified all foods, that is, against the Pharisees, declared all foods not capable of rendering the body impure, in accord with Moses and not with the Pharisaic traditions of the elders. This is, in my opinion, a more than acceptable interpretation of verse 19c. It is not about kashrut, but about purity and impurity. Usage of this verb in general, katharizen, throughout the Septuagint and other New Testament passages suggests strongly that it is cleansing from or declaring clean from ritual purity that is the sense required here. Since only kosher foods can become impure, a Jew would never speak about declaring non-kosher foods pure or impure, but only kosher ones. A piece of pork is neither pure nor impure. It is forbidden. A piece of beef may be pure or impure. Menachem Kister has made this point. The assumption that Jesus is saying applies exclusively to defiled kosher food is quite natural. In a Jewish context, the expression defiled food often means defiled kosher food. In rabbinic literature, in the sense of defiled kosher food, simply because kosher food is the only food eaten by Jews. We don't care whether any food, other food is pure or impure. The category is not relevant. It's only relevant for permitted food. And again, impure food is only forbidden for priests who are serving in the temple. As Kister further points out, Jesus' statement is only coherent if he is speaking about kosher food that has become defiled which of course is entirely consistent, I uh, uh, repeat, with the context of the narrative in which the disciples are not being accused of eating food that is not kosher, but food that, it is, in, that is impure. And it is that impurity that Jesus declares invalid, not the distinction between kosher and non-kosher. In direct contradiction to the Pharisaic innovation of washing hands to prevent food from becoming impure, says Jesus, you may eat kosher food, whether or not it has become defiled and impure, and you will not become thus impure, just as the written Torah explicitly teaches. But this has absolutely nothing to do with abrogating the law at all. It is the finale of Jesus' answer as to why his disciples do not perform ritual ablution. There remains one third possibility, one that I will propose in a highly tentative fashion, and is highly speculative as well. Namely, that katharizon does not mean here declared all foods pure, but purified all foods. But there's a distinction between declared all foods pure or actually did an action of purification. Once again, it is vital to emphasize that the purity of foods and their permissibility are not at all the same halachic system. And the failure of many interpreters of Mark, traditional and modern, to understand this engenders much confusion. Now, given 
that in Zechariah 13, 2, God promises that on that day I will remove the spirit of impurity from the land. This, on this reading, would be part and parcel of Jesus' claiming his messianic office. Even more, right? If, 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 if the Messiah on that day will remove impurity from the land, Jesus may be claiming his messianic office here. But again, it has nothing to do with, with, with whether you can eat a pig or not. Even more explicitly, in the same prophet, at 14, 20, 21, we read, On that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, Holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the house of the Lord shall be as holy as the bowls in front of the altar. And every cooking pot in Jerusalem and Judea shall be sacred to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and use them to boil the flesh of the sacrifice. And there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Now, this would make our text parallel to the passage in chapter 2, where Jesus claims to be Lord of the Sabbath in his messianic role of Son of Man, but does not say that the Sabbath is no longer to be observed. Right? Even there, when he says I'm, that, that I, as the Son of Man, am Lord of the Sabbath, he doesn't say, and now there is no more Sabbath. It would be a rather uh, weak lordship if he were Lord of a Sabbath that doesn't exist. My inclination now is toward the first explanation, the text critical one, but this I assert strongly in any case an interpretation that takes 19c at face value as indicating that the point of the pericope is to explain Jesus' total abrogation of food prohibitions is forced to engage in much more special pleading than the perhaps somewhat forced readings I've suggested here for 19c. Right? I rather like the third one. There are other powerful arguments that Jesus was not understood in any quarter of the earliest church as having abrogating, abrogated the rules of Kashru. Neither of the other synoptics understand him thus, nor did the, the disciples and acts who entered into the agreement on foods, nor those Christian martyrs of Lyon who bought their kosher meat from Jews, according to Eusebius. Right? And this is like uh, a century later, or more than a century later. Moreover, Origen himself read the entire controversy as being about Pharisaic innovation and not an alleged dominical uh, abrogation of the law of Moses. As remarked by Svartvik, it is important to Origen that the Pharisees and the scribes accuse the disciples before their teacher for transgressing not a commandment of God, but only one tra tradition of the Jewish elders. Svartvik goes on in the next several pages of his book to demonstrate that according to Origen, it is only in apostolic times after the death and resurrection of Jesus that the Kashrut laws were abrogated, that it is, is that it is, it, it is only the suffering of Jesus on the cross that redeemed even the disciples from the curse of the law. He obviously read the Markan text more or less in accord with the reading suggested herein, in my work here. Svartvik also shows there, however, that Origen is not entirely consistent in this reading and is led into self-contradiction when he tries to reconcile the meaning of the gospel text which he has accurately perceived and his Christian antinomian practice. Quote, Thus, in a fascinating way, Origen outlines a, a law-abiding Jesus within the boundaries of first century Judaism, but also a justification for Christians not observing Jewish halakha. He tried to have it both ways, but can one? Anyway, I once was giving uh, talks at Vancouver School of Theology, and uh, 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 Professor Tannehill was there at the same time. And um, it, it, they have a wonderful summer program. Um, um, that might be emulatable by seminaries all over. They have intensive study for working ministers who come for two or three weeks in the summer and engage in 
in serious textual study for several hours a day with local faculty and also visiting faculty who run. And uh, believe me, the ministers who choose to come and study for three weeks rather than going to the beach are the, um, the, the intellectual flower of the ministry. It's thrilling, it's thrilling to, to, to teach them and it, it creates an atmosphere that is remarkable. So one of them raised his hand after a while after hearing me talking about the Gospels and said, what's the difference between you, Dr. Boyarin, and Jews for Jesus? Right? And I said, oh, it's an enormous difference. Jews for Jesus think that Jews have to believe in the Christ in order to be saved. And I think it's fine for folks to believe in Christ, but in order to be saved, you've got to keep kosher and Sabbath. <laughs> Perhaps, however, one of the most interesting ancient testimonia for a literal reading of the parable prior to its figurative resolution comes from Athanasius. I'm bringing out some pretty big guns here, right? <laughs> Origen, Athanasius, the martyrs of Lyon, who in his letter to Amun refers to a group of Egyptian Christian ascetics who have understood Jesus' declaration that what comes out of the body renders one unclean as a literal affirmation by Jesus of the law of Leviticus and Deuteronomy to the effect that emissions render a body unclean in accord with the literal sense of the parable. Right? So you've got a whole group of monks in Egypt who are reading Mark 7 in that way. As Farkvik conclu concludes with respect to the addressees of Athanasius' letter, hence we have come across proof that a group of Christians at the time of Athanasius fourth century, argued that the saying actually reinforced Levitical purity laws. In Leviticus 15 and 16, words for going out are actually being used, yatsa in Hebrew, and exerkestai, uh, chestai. This interpretation, of course, of the literal level of the Dominical parable is in complete accord with the interpretation of the pericope offered here. Athanasius, needless to say, disagreed with this interpretation, taking Jesus as saying to be abrogating Levitical prohibitions on purity and on forbidden foods and not supporting them. From beginning to end, this pericope is a controversy between Jesus and the Pharisees about how correctly to observe and defend Moses' Torah, not a controversy between Christians and Jews as to whether Moses is still applicable. Now when Jesus explains the parable to his uncomprehending disciples, it is clear what he is doing. He is showing how the literal force of the halakha itself should be read as indicating its spiritual or moral meaning. Indeed, it is not what goes into the mouth that renders one impure, but the impure intentions of a heart, as signified by the halakhic fact that things that go out of the body cause impurity. Right, what we have here really is, um, I think, um, a, a Jesus who is much more alive than in the traditional reading to the significance of embodied piety, of embodied practice. Right? It, it, it's not um, a, not a, a Jesus who is downplaying the moral significance. The message of the, that the significance of the halakha is through understanding it anagogically is not uh, erased on this reading, but um, a, um, a, a mark in Jesus, a fortiori, a Mathean Jesus, who is much more alive to the, that it is the way that one conducts life in, in every minute and in every, that that conduces to that conduces to um, a spiritual and, and uh, moral practice as well. All of the practices to which Jesus refers to as Pharisaic, hand washing, washing of vessels, all are connected with the particular traditions of the Pharisees regarding the encroachment of impure foods on the purity of the body. In other words, he's got it right historically. The Talmud itself tells us that these are Pharisaic innovations. 
Those Pharisees who believe that impurity comes from without, or worse, add such impurity to the Torahs, do not comprehend, as at first neither do, do the disciples what the spiritual import of the Torah's rule about impurity coming from within truly is. Otherwise, they wouldn't have messed about with it. When Jesus speaks of the purity or impurity of foods, he is not therefore speaking about kosher system, but about the Pharisaic understanding of purity practices that are part of their tradition of the elders and not that which is written by Moses in the Torah. It follows from this that neither Jesus nor the evangelist held, suggested, or implied that the new Jesus movement involved the rejection of traditional Jewish practices around eating, nor that it constituted a step out to form a new quote-unquote religion. Marx, Jesus is defending the sanctity of the law and its ultimate meaningfulness, not attacking them. I'm going to skip a bit. Jesus, on this interpretation, would be countering the Pharisees' extensions of the law with an argument from Moses. Precisely and in good faith, just as his argument against the Pharisees vis-a-vis -vis the feed feeding of parents is from Moses and not against Moses. By the way, there's a, a beautiful philological point that can be made here. This, this, is, this is where, where philology and theology um, meet. Remember, Jesus says, it says in the verse in the Torah, that one must honor father and mother, right? And then Jesus says, and he who does not honor father and mother curses them. And because it says, look to Kalel. What Jesus says is actually much stronger. He understood, he understood the Hebrew better than most um, Old Testament scholars. Well, it was his native language, you know. <laughs> the way we say honor is lichabed. Lichabed literally means to make heavy, right? To treat parents with gravitas, to make, make heavy. And yet everyone understands that the way you honor father and mother is not by saying nice things to them, but by feeding them, by taking care of them. That is the way you honor your parents. Now, the verse that we usually translate curse is lekalel. Lekalel means to make light. It's the opposite of lechabed. So Jesus correctly understands, I think correctly understands it to mean the opposite of lechabed. If lechabed, to make heavy, is to feed, then not to feed is lekalel. And that's the point of, the, of, 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 of Jesus' homily there, right? So how can you Pharisees say that it's okay to make a vow not to feed your parents and then you, and, and then you don't feed them when the Torah says that this is cursing them, lekalel? Throughout the pericope, Jesus' argument against the Pharisees has been that they changed the Torah's rulings, Moses, in the name of their tradition of the elders. The interpretation that I've often maintains that this, that theme right through verse 15, 17, explaining also why it is crucial to observe the law as written and not add to, what, to it what the later rabbis would call fences around it. The law is a parable. If you don't tell the story correctly, you cannot understand or interpret the parable properly. Now, according to this reading, the import of the Markin passage is substantially the same as the arguably more explicit parallel in Matthew 15. You don't have it on the handout, but you all know it, so I'll read it out loud and you'll recognize it. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. He answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? 
For God said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But let's take that speaks evil. Whoever doesn't feed father and mother shall surely die. But you say that whoever tells father or mother, whatever support you might have, might have had from me is given to God, then that person need not honor the father. So for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God. Right? And this is what Jesus is saying here. Is it possible to imagine that three lines later he's going to make void the word of God? You hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You see how precise his reading of, of Isaiah is there. That's what they're doing. They're teaching human precepts as, doc as doctrines. From the Torah. Now, of course, I'm not giving the Pharisees side in the argument here. <laughs> they have an argument back. But that's not what interests me right now. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Referring back to the washing of the hands. Then the disciples approached and said, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. He doesn't say, I come to uproot what my heavenly Father has planted. Let them alone, they are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. And then listen to what he says. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. There is no reason to make, I'm not, you know, I'm not a great harmonizer, but there is no reason to make Mark and Matthew um, antithetical to each other. If we read Mark carefully, it's the same story as we find in Matthew. It will be seen that given my interpretation of Mark 7, the Matthean version is a close match for it. Here there may be no question at all that the issue is purity rules, the washing of hands, and nothing else. Jesus explicitly concludes, these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. In one respect, however, on the reading offered here, the reading of Mark is superior to the reading of Matthew. For by substituting what comes out of the mouth for what comes out of the person, Matthew has obscured the parable. One would imagine not deliberately, but through his own misunderstanding. Because it's not things that come out of the mouth that make him pure, but actually things that come out of the genitals. If my interpretation of Mark is acceptable, however, even that tampering has not succeeded in eradicating its meaning for those who have ears to hear. It is historically perverse, in my view, to assume that the Mark before Matthew incorporated a dominical rejection of the food laws of the Torah which Matthew then neutralized for his own quote-unquote Judaizing purposes. Just saying it this way indicates, I think, how tendentious such a position is, how predetermined by later Christian theology, itself inflected by Paul. The historical stakes are high. Robert Gundry writes openly that since Marx is the earliest Palestinian witness to Jesus, Mark, our earliest gospel, I'm quoting him, offers a more reliable standard, and it says that Jesus abrogated laws of food and purity and violated the Sabbath. Right? So you get a sense of what's at stake here. While our reading certainly leads to the conclusion that the historical Jesus did not intend, intend in any way through his logion to displace the Torah's law. I believe that the exact opposite is the case from Gundry, claiming that in Mark as well, when the passage is read as a whole, there is no reason at all to deem Jesus as being portrayed as abrogating the law, but rather doing exactly what he claims to be doing, 
namely defending Moses from the distortions and abrogations of the law allegedly perpetrated by the Pharisees. This is in Mark, Jesus and Moses allied against the Pharisees, not as in Paul, Jesus against Moses in any way, shape, or form. I'm referring to the passage in Corinthians, those who read Moses, you know, uh, see um, as through a glass darkly. Jesus taught the law, not fought the law. According to the view that I offer here, Mark is no more antinomian than the allegedly than the alleged historical Jesus himself. Okay, that's enough. Let's have some conversation. Can you take questions? Sure. We'll take questions. You may want to be brief. Uh, in your honor, we've uh, prepared some things in the gallery to weigh you down. <laughs> things to eat. What, what might uh, someone have? Yes. So do you think today that the Torah is applicable to Christians? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's just, that's histor historically ridiculous, of course, because it would be impossible to imagine. Um, uh, but uh, insofar, insofar, Well, it's hard to say. You know, I mean, what 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 would I mean by that? No, what, what would I mean by that? Um, Let me narrow it down. The Ten Commandments, specifically in the Sabbath, applicable to Christians. No, you don't need to narrow it down. Uh, you don't need to narrow it down. Uh, it, it would be extremely arrogant for me, other than in jest to suggest to uh, uh, Christians uh, what they ought or are not to, to be doing. All I would say is that um, I'm pretty convinced that my reading of the gospel is correct. And then uh, it's a question of um, if, if my reading of the gospel is deemed compelling, then I would wonder what conclusion a serious adherence of the gospel would would draw. That's that's I think a, a, that's a less arrogant way of saying it, right? Let's say on the rabbinic side of things, um, you have any respect for you agree with all the uh, interpretation of the Noahide laws to declare righteous Gentiles who aren't necessarily Jews? Yes, absolutely. Okay, the, uh, the, uh, according to rabbinic theology, Gentiles can be saved by observing only uh, seven commandments called the Noahide rules, the rules, the rule, Noah as the ancestor of all people, right? And um, uh, so there is no, uh, there is no claim in rabbinic Judaism that only Jews are saved. Right? So under the category of Gentiles, from, from the perspective of, uh, of, uh, of rabbinical theology, um, there, uh, there is, sal there is uh, a, a path to salvation for everyone in the world. Right? And, uh, and these are all virtually universal laws, right? Um, avoiding incest, bloodshed, um, tearing limbs off living animals to eat them, having legal system. Um, you know, a, a fairly straightforward, uh, a, a accessible laws. Insofar as Gentiles want to claim that they are not Gentiles, but adherents of the gospel, that's when the question would come up, right? And, and that would come up, not for Jews, but for, but for Christians, right? It's not, my, it's not my problem, right? 
Well, it's more, it's more complicated than that. that that's that's a fair, uh, one fair way of thinking about Paul, and it's one that's been, um, uh, that, that has been advanced. Um, uh, uh, I'm not yet convinced of it, but as I hinted, I, I'm on the way, I'm on the way to, uh, to being convinced by that also. But you know, there, there, are many com there are many communities of Christians, obviously small ones, but there are many communities of Christians who have come to the conclusion that they need to be observing the Torah as Christians. Um, I had a neighbor, I had a neighbor in, uh, in Berkeley from the south, and she told me once that her mother had joined one of those churches. And she says, now it's just one holiday after another. <laughs> it's, it's Christmas and Hanukkah and Easter and Passover. My mother never gets out of the kitchen anymore. <laughs> Yeah, see, but but the, the people say, well, that's that's in Matthew, right? In Matthew's that sort of backsliding, backsliding Judaizing uh, 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 gospel. That itself, that itself is a problem, I would think. You know, in terms of a Christian theology, it's one of the gospels. So to sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, marginalize it uh, on its own uh, 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 would um, would be uh, perhaps troubling. But you know we've got our own problems too. Uh, we um, allow the selling of leaven in our possession before Passover to Gentiles, right? You get it out of your house or contain it, and then it says that you're not, you're not allowed to have any any leaven on on Passover. Uh, and any that you have has to be destroyed, right? So people not wanting to destroy stocks of food and drink. Um, we've developed a custom, somewhat dubious from some points of view, of selling our leaven uh, and then buying it back right after Passover. <laughs> well, um, I used to live in a town in Israel called Omer, in the negative. And one year I forgot to sell my leaven. And here it is, one hour before Passover. And if I don't sell my leaven, I'm going to have to pour out several bottles of single malt scotch. <laughs> so how am I going to solve this problem? Well, a, there. no, he wasn't around, but across, <laughs> right, across the street, there was a Christian family. But they were Christians who were observers of the law. Now, from my benighted position, I saw Gentiles, right? This is, um, this is a, a, I'm, I'm revealing my sin here today. So I went across the street and I said, um, you know, I forgot to sell my, my, my leaven um, and, and I'm going to have to waste, you know, $500 worth of whiskey if I don't sell it to a Gentile. Um, can I sell, sell you my uh, leaven? The gentleman across the street said, I've burnt all of mine. <laughs> I suggest you do the same. <laughs> And that was a, you know, that was a, a moment of recognition, not so much about selling leaven. I, I continue to do that. It's the tradition and we do it. But of the um, necessity from my perspective to not simply look at the world outside of the Jewish people as the Gentiles, right? And as such, and, and, and as such, it is conceivable for me to say, well, 
if you if you don't consider yourself Gentiles and and say that the the book of the God of Israel and the Gospels may claim on you, then then it's conceivable that um, this kind of interpretation, to the extent that it's that it's convincing, right? It may, it may not be convincing, but to the extent that it's convincing, I would see that it, that it would make some, make some trouble, you know, make some trouble. Anyway, if you decide to make the um, the kitchen kosher here, um, I'll be glad to be the supervisor of the. You know, I can write, retire in style to um, Ohio and. <laughs> No, I understand that. You know, um, um, making people uncomfortable is part of my stock and trade. You know, <laughs> and I, uh, but but I'm but I'm fair. You know, when the um, the Jewish studies program came under attack at Berkeley, and in fact was dismantled finally, and one of the charges against the Jewish studies program, the graduate program in Jewish studies at Berkeley, was that we don't contribute to making Jewish stu students feel more comfortable on campus, which to my mind just uh, is indicative of, of, the, uh, of a kind of contempt for Jewish studies as an academic discipline, right? They think of us as some sort of a, an arm of Hillel or something. So I, I said on that occasion that I have devoted my life to making Jews uncomfortable, not to making them comfortable, right? So, would it be fair if I only made Jews uncomfortable? <laughs> One last question. In light of uh, distinguishing Paul from Jesus in both Mark and Matthew, did yeah. you do with Acts 10 and Cornelius, Acts 10, 15, and 20? Yeah. Did you uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I obviously can't go into detail. It would take it would take an analysis as long as this, but uh, but uh, I, I think read carefully, that is no more about actually abrogating uh, the Torah than 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 um, the Markan passage. The the foods, the unclean and clean foods, there are are symbols of people. And not and not of food, right? And uh, and the whole thing is a uh, a kind of apocalyptic parable about the acceptance of different kinds of people. That's that's my short answer. Obviously, it needs an extended defense and careful reading. Um, but I think it's within the genre, a genre of something like the the first century animal apocalypse in which the different peoples of the world are imagined as sheep and goats and cows and uh, it, it's that kind of, um, uh, but I, I am going to be writing about that um, sometime in the yeah, near future. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. 
Oh, uh, I, I'm asked if I have any closing comments, and my closing comment is that it has been a, for me, a simply delightful day, um, meeting and engaging with such um, serious and engaged folk and um, who understand that, as John put it, that reading of books is not, the reading of texts is not a, uh, a, an arid or purely antiquarian or scholarly enterprise, but um, one, one of the most um, vital activities that we can engage in as human beings. So I, I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us in the gallery.